So that was a special part of this day. Also, you have a special guest preacher who is here with us. Pastor Taryn Montgomery was my colleague not too far away when she served at Bread of Life Lutheran Church in Minot. And now she's my colleague a little bit farther away uh, in Duluth, Minnesota. Pastor Taryn is a wise voice in our denomination around generosity. So we've asked her to be here to share some wise words of generosity today. So great, thank you, Pastor Taryn and your son Peter, who are here with us today. We're going to jump into the call to worship. So I invite you to find the words in the bulletin or on the screen. Your words are the bold print as you get a glimpse of the reading for today. Solomon had a picture of the church in mind. Solomon's church was a building for God. Although the building was a nice fit, God outgrew it. God dwells in all the places I go, and God waits for us in the places we've yet to go. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, we have sinned against you and our neighbors. We have taken what is not ours and justified our actions. We have turned away from your wisdom. We have not done justice, loved kindness, nor walked humbly with you. Forgive us for the harms we have caused through the word and action and restore us to the joy of following your will for us. Amen. These are your words of forgiveness and freedom and love. God knows our every weakness and yet loves us without ceasing. Rejoice and be glad for the God of grace and mercy forgives you all your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as you may and join in singing our Reformation hymn on this Reformation Sunday. We remember how Martin Luther, a long time ago, looked at the Bible and found words of grace that have stuck around for generations since. So you get to sing the first and the fourth verse, thanks to the choir. We'll sing verses two and three.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. I'm going to skip over the hymn of praise and continue with the prayer of the day. And after the prayer of the day, Pastor Taryn will invite children to come on up for a children's sermon. Let us pray. Generous God, you promised Solomon whatever he wanted, and he asked you only for the wisdom to serve you. Grant us that same wisdom that we might work for your justice in the world. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Again, welcome to Pastor Taryn. If you're listening over the radio, you'll also hear some special music from Lauren Holder on the violin and Christy Chernick on bells. If there's any kiddos that want to come on up here, I would love to have some company. So come on up. All the way up. Please. Pretty please. Pretty, pretty please. All right. There comes a good crew. We've got a leader of the pack here. Super. You guys can just sit like right here on the floor floor so you can see what I got going on up here okay perfect but you can face me so you can see what's going on yeah how are you guys are you excited for tomorrow what's happening tomorrow Halloween I'm so excited too awesome all right you guys can have a seat I want to show you a few different things this morning the first is this little plastic bracelet this is vintage do you know why it's almost, oh, do you know why? Yeah, because it, it was with a typewriter. <laughs> this is almost 40 years old. And almost 40 years ago, guess whose wrist it was on? Mine. When I was born, this is what the doctors put on my wrist. And the name at the top says Tiana Montgomery. That, was, that is my mom. That's my mom, actually. And then it has some numbers and my birth date, and you can't hardly see it, but it says baby girl. So this was on my wrist when I was born in the hospital. It's got my mama's name on it. And just like you, if you were born in a hospital or at home or wherever it was, you grew up, your parents gave you a name. So my name is Taryn Catherine Montgomery. And not long after I was born, like a year later, guess what happened? Do you, how many candles are in that cupcake? One candle. That's me on my first birthday. That's my dad with his super cool mustache. Rock in the 80s. You like that? Yeah. My brother ate a candle. He ate a candle? A chocolate chip. A chocolate chip candle? They make edible candles now? I am missing out. So that was my first birthday. And that's my dad. He's pretty cool. He's very important to me. Well, guess what happened? I grew up. I love chocolate cupcakes. You're making me hungry. I grew up, and these are some other important people in my life. That's my mom, Tiana. This one's me. Is that my twin? No, she's not my twin, but we look a lot alike. Guess who that is? That's my baby sister. Her name is Trina. So my mom, Tiana, my sister, you saw my dad. But guess who else is in my family? Before my parents, guess who came before them? My grandparents. These are the wedding pictures of my grandparents. So this is my, my Oma and Opa. That's German, grandma and grandpa in German. And my grandma and grandpa, that's my um, grandma Catherine, where I get my middle name, and my grandpa Owen. So that's them on their wedding day. And guess what? Owen is coming back. I know lots of Owens. Oh no. Okay, so guess who this is? How did you know? This was my great grandma. Her name was Rhoda, which is my daughter's name. And she, until she was 90, she died when she was 96. And like up until she was 95, she was part of this little choir called the Swingin' Dingalings of Lawrence County, Illinois. So they all, these 90 year old women all had these little horns and they would like go play in parades and stuff. So that's Grandma Rhoda. She was super cool. And I also have had 
This, this is my Uncle Bill and Aunt Anna. They were my great aunt and uncle. Yesterday we like, uh, uh, trick-or-treated. Uh, we got so many candy. Oh man, love candy. And this is Bill and Anna. Many years later, that's when um, my Aunt Anna was in the nursing home. And they, guess how many years they were married? Any guesses? Take a guess. A million. <laughs> 53, close, sort of. 73 years they were married. Don't they look good? You know why they look so good? They didn't have kids. That's why they look so good. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so then my grandma, this is my Oma, she and I were very, very close. So this is also her in that wedding picture. She was one of the most important people in my life, and she just died a couple years ago. So I have that picture on my, um, on my desk. And then, you know what? Not just the people before me, but you know who that is? Who do you think that is? Dad. No, who, that's me. Who's that guy next to me? Dad. It's, not, it's your dad. That's my husband. Yeah. That's Kristoff, and he, he's in my family now, no. right? No, uh, Krabel, would, you, would you like to preach? You're really good at this. I think we should just, I should just go sit down. What's your name? Isaiah. Isaiah. Oh, and it's biblical. Look at this. I think we have a preacher in the house. There's a discernment event on the, the 6th of November, I hear, happening. Pastor Lisa? Okay, and then these are my kiddos. I do have a lot of kids. Well, there are only, there's only three of them, but they seem like a lot sometimes. Yeah, that's Peter right there in the middle. So these people are all very important to me, and they're in my family. But do you think there's people not in my family who are also really important to me? Can I show you an example of one? Do you guys what happened in that picture? Okay, kind of. So they are kind of like that. There's something happening at your church this afternoon called Affirmation of Baptism or Confirmation. And this was Confirmation Sunday at Bread of Life Lutheran Church several years ago. You can see the red banners in the background, just like you have your red banners. And I'm in there. But do you see the people in there with me? These were all the Confirmation students. What do you notice about them? They're, they have, they're wearing their confirmation stoles around the neck. Now, I have a question. They're mostly like in high school, but do you think that guy's in high school? How old do you think that guy is? <laughs> He's not 99, but he was like 79. That's Tom. Almost, yeah. And there's like three people in that confirmation class that were adults. And this, I love this picture because this shows how the church is all ages, right? They were never confirmed as... As, um, um, are you? Um, my dad hired someone named Tom. He has someone named Tom, too? Tom's a great name. Also biblical. All right. So nonetheless, these are some of the people in my family and outside of my family who are really, really important to me. And do you know why? Because they are across the generations. The word generation means, like, an age group, right? So, like... Like a family tree, exactly. So like, you guys are one generation, or yeah, neighbors can be part of, I'm like another generation. I'm gonna pick on Faith. Faith would be like another generation. And then I'm gonna, is it Julie or Julia? Oh, Josie, how did I get that wrong? My sister Josie would be another generation, and other ones out here too, right? So all these generations are a part of the family of God that in like Grandma Rhoda, right? Right here at St. John's Lutheran Church. And we are talking today about something called generational generosity. Now, what does the word generosity mean? Any guesses? Happy, yeah, absolutely. What else would it mean? Does it mean sharing? Caring? If you're generous, you're maybe like giving something away or you're giving the gift of love away. Or tomorrow night when you go trick-or-treating, you're going to really hope the people on the other side of the door are very generous, right? Because you want some candy, I'm guessing. Am I right? I, I eat all my candy. Oh my goodness. Well, then you got more coming tomorrow probably. So generational generosity is this idea that through the generations, all these people and all of these people are sharing God's love with you and 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 you. And you, and you, and you. 
One second. So that you can go and share that love with everybody else. Isaiah's got a question. What, help us out, what's that called? Fun dip. Fun dip! I knew, that's my daughter's favorite. Fun dip is good stuff. We got a question. I know, right? You know what, I act, this is actually artwork. This was a picture in the newspaper and I did an etching of it. So I couldn't find the real picture, it's in a box somewhere, but yeah. You guys have so much energy, I love it. You know what we're gonna do? We are gonna say a little prayer and then you are gonna go back to your seat and you are gonna share this genera generational generosity of energy with everybody out there. Sound good? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for all the people who've come before us, for us and for all the people who are still yet to come. Bless your love, your kingdom, your creation through the use of our hands and our gifts and our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, yeah, we can do some cross. Oh, I love that. All right, you guys can head back to your seats. Thanks for coming up. Isaiah's parents, watch out. He's a preacher in the making right there. I love it. Do you want to do the acclamation? Okay. We're going to go right into the gospel, or rather the first reading, the OT reading, and that comes from 1 Kings chapter 3. A king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for what was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said to him, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept it for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now... O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I'm only a little child. I do not yet know how to come out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil for who can govern this, your great people? Word of God, word of life. Amen. Thanks be to God. My name is Taryn Catherine Montgomery. I'm the daughter of Charlie and Tiana Montgomery and a sister to Trina Montgomery. On my mother's side, my maternal grandparents were Esther and Wilbert Osterber. And on my father's side, Owen and Kate Montgomery, and later Virginia Montgomery. My great-grandparents on my father's side were Rhoda and Ernest Montgomery, and Lillian and Justice Meyer. And on my mother's side, it was Frank and Ellardina Osterber, and Fred and Geska Lushen. These are my ancestors. These are my people. And the ones who came before them, their stories I now carry. I have inherited so much of who they were and who they remain. When you think of the word inheritance, what is one of the first things that comes to mind? This is the interactive part. Say it out loud. Money. Oh, come on, a little bit louder. Money, right? You didn't think you were going to bring in a stewardship guest preacher and not hear about money this morning. Yes, we often think about dollar signs when we think about inheritance, but it can also be other things. It might look like farmland. It might look like a family-owned business. 
It might look like your dad's 69 Camaro back there in the garage or your mother's beloved wedding ring. It can also look like maybe less financially significant things. It could look like the color of your eyes, your body shape, your dimples, your smile, your nose. It could look like the family traditions that have been passed on. It could be that recipe that your mom knew by heart and my goodness what you would give to have it written down. Or maybe you do have it written down on that really worn little index card that you revisit every Christmas when you make just that perfect cookie like she always did. It could also be things that are less good or idyllic or heartwarming. We can inherit our family baggage. We can inherit failed relationships, maybe a parent's divorce, addiction. We might inherit someone else's trauma, and it could have been generations ago, but it just keeps sitting in the family system, and now we have to deal and cope with it. But there's something else that we might inherit that I don't know we often think about in terms of inheritance. And that would be a spirit of generosity. Inheriting the faith and care and compassion and the love of those who have come before us in a way that shapes who we are and we live our life as an expression of that generosity that we have watched modeled for us in those years prior. I love this theme of generational generosity that you have been exploring for the last couple weeks and you're continuing to explore. As I believe later this week, you'll get your commitment card in the mail and you'll be invited to prayerfully consider what God might be putting on your heart to give and share generously with the ministry here at St. John's Lutheran Church. And I've been pondering in preparation for today what generational generosity means for me. Who am I and how am I a, a fruit, if you will, of all of those who have come before? All of those who have come before. And I've been pondering a very distinct conversation that I recall having with my parents about money when I was in high school. My dad was going to make a, a job switch, and with that was going to come a decrease in pay that was pretty significant, but it was going to come with an increase in his quality of life. And you know that saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? The same is true for dad. And if dad's a little bit happier, the rest of us are going to be a little bit happier. So we were all on board with this change, but we knew it was going to make a difference in what we were, how we were living our lifestyle. And so my parents sat my sister and I down with the family budget, and line by line they said, this is what we've been spending on this, and this is where it's going to have to be shaved off over here. Left, right, left, right. And then we got to the very last line item, which when I think about it probably should have been at the top since it was the first fruits, and that number, that percentage was not going to change. And the title of that line was Tithe. Now, I had not heard that word prior to this point. I had watched my parents write the checks and put it in the envelope and put it in the offering plate as it went by. I knew they were very generous with their finances and their time and all of those pieces, but I never quite understood just how much they were giving every single month and that they were so committed to it. And so what followed was a conversation with my mom and dad about, so what is a tithe? And how does this first fruits 10% of your paycheck combined every single month just automatically go to the church? And as we were having that conversation, I started to ponder the other ways I had watched my parents model this generosity in their life. It wasn't something they just thought up. This line item wasn't something they just created. It had been passed down through the generations. My mom's mom, my Oma, every Monday morning would go to the church and straighten up the hymnals in every pew, because it gets a little crazy around these pews on Sunday mornings, right? She was very good German, very tidy. Everything was just right. The visitor cards were put back. The little pencils were sharpened and in their places. She was giving not just of her money, but also of her time for a ministry 
that she loved and cared for, St. John's Lutheran Church in Royal, Illinois. My dad had watched his parents do similarly in the church, but also in the larger community, where my grandfather owned a Western Auto hardware store in the town square, and every Christmas, of course, they were the primary toy supplier in town, and all the parents would come in and peruse the shelves, and my grandpa Owen would know who would be able to afford what and who might be a little bit, you know, in a tough spot that particular year. So when they would bring the toy up to the register, my grandpa Owen would often say, we'll just let that one go. It's on the house. That spirit of generosity, an expression of his faith, a good Methodist that he was, coming out in how he ran his business, how he cared for his neighbors. My parents had watched this, modeled for them, and now they were living it, My mom, an organist at the church, my dad, active in just about every leadership thing possible, from council to committees, not only that, but serving in the Lions Club and the Chamber of Commerce, and my mom leading my 4-H club. I mean, in every way, I watched them in their faith, in their church, in their work, and in their community share this generosity that had been passed down to them. They had inherited it. And they were going to share it, no matter how tough times might In our scripture story for today, we encounter King Solomon, soon to be king, as he is inheriting this lineage within his family system of kingship, leadership, following in the footsteps of his father, King David. And in gratitude to God for this huge opportunity and privilege and job, he goes to Gibeon to offer a sacrifice, as was the tradition in his culture, in his family. And as he is there, he has this dream where God and he have this conversation. God says, Solomon, ask for whatever you need. Just ask for it. And Solomon's probably feeling a little bit timid about this new post he's about to take on. So he has this kind of long response to God about all the things that he is in need of. And one of the things that really sticks out is that Solomon prays to God, asks God to give him a heart of discernment, of good judgment. Good judgment. Now, Solomon's a wise guy, and he knows that his family generational line of kings some family baggage in there. Remember King David and Bathsheba? Maybe you know the story of Amnon and Absalom and Samuel. I mean, King David was, he had, he had some stuff going on. We'll just put it that way. That's another sermon. But nonetheless, King Solomon realizes there's some things about my dad I don't really want to carry on, but there are other pieces that I do. So God, help me. Help me decipher and figure out what it means to be a good and faithful leader so I can go and lead the people with a heart for justice and peace and compassion and love so that I can inherit what is good about this role and share this love with the world around me. Essentially, Solomon is asking God to continue instilling in him and his generations to come this spirit of generosity. The spirit of generosity. Now, at the beginning of my sermon, I named who some of those ancestors are for me. Some of those people in my family or even outside my family who have helped shape my lens of this generous spirit. And I want you to take a moment right now, and I want you to ponder. You can close your eyes, get comfortable, don't fall asleep if you haven't yet. But nonetheless, in some sense, think about that person who has helped shape your spirit of generosity. What's their name? Say it in your head. What do you remember or recall about them? As if they're right there in the pew next to you. Perhaps they have passed on, or maybe they're still among us. Think of a moment when you can remember watching them share generously and how that made you feel. And ask yourself, 
How is my life different today because of what I learned from them? Who is your person? Who is that ancestor of faith? Who is that saint? In just a couple days in the church, we will mark All Saints Day, and next Sunday you'll mark it here in worship, where you will likely name out loud those who have died in the year past or maybe years prior. We often think of those who have entered into God's eternal glory, but it's true that we as Lutherans believe we're all saints, and so there's saints in the pew right next to you, believe it or not. Husbands and wives don't look at each other too closely. You are saints to one another. But just the same, these are the saints that God has placed in our life to teach us what it means to live these lives of faith, to go forth and share this gospel and this good news because, my goodness, we just can't help but keep that line item of that tithe or that offering or that generosity in the budget because someone has done it for us and we want to make sure those who come after have that same opportunity. Look around this room for a bit. Take in the windows, take in the stonework, take in the red decorated up front. Your your bulletin is very organized. That took a lovely admin person, I'm sure, in the office just down the road with lots of word editing and documenting. Your music this morning, phenomenal. That takes staffing, your organist, your director, your pastor. Beyond this building, the faith formation that happens on Wednesday nights, the ways that our young people are being formed in lives of faith and go forth into their schools or into the community, the ways that you live out your faith every single day in your jobs, that nine to five grind or maybe in retirement or whatever it looks like, all of that is possible because an ancestor of your faith thought Dickinson, North Dakota needs this. And here it is. Not just benefiting you, but benefiting all of those far and wide. And do you want this to be here tomorrow, 10, 20, 50 years from now? What do you hope it looks like? What do you hope your children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren might know about God's love as as it has been encountered through the ministry in this place? That's the invitation of the Spirit. That is the invitation of generational generosity. It's not just about us, but it's about what has been coming through the generations inherent in who we are and how we live our lives of faith. Now, in closing, I mentioned at the very beginning, there are people in my faith life who have taught me about generosity. They're not just in my family. And one of them was a young woman from the congregation I served in Minot, Bread of Life Lutheran Church. And she and her family had been at Bread of Life for about three years at this point. And at council one night, she was on, you know, I've You've been around for a year, we're going to put you on council. So she was on council, and we were sitting around the table, and we were doing this generosity practice where I asked them, just like I asked you, to think about that person that had taught and modeled a spirit of generosity. And one by one, we went around the table and shared their name and the lesson that we had learned from them. And we'll we'll call her Sarah. We get to Sarah at the very end, and she said, I didn't grow up in the church. My parents as far as I know, never gave money to certainly any church or even like nonprofit or good cause, at least not that I'm aware of. She paused for a moment and she said, I learned generosity from you. I learned generosity from the family of God at Bread of Life Lutheran Church as a nearly 40-year-old woman. This is the first time I've ever seen it modeled in a way that connected to my faith. And it makes sense to me. Sarah was teaching the rest of us at that table that this inheritance is really about the family of God, the kingdom of God that we are a part of, and she wants to be a part of, and she's committed to being a part of so that she can teach it to her children and the generations yet to come. So who is your person? Who is your ancestor? Who is the saint 
that modeled this for you. Let their voice echo in your ear. Today, tomorrow, or later this week when you get that card in the mail as you ponder and pray over the story of Solomon and the inheritance of asking for God's discernment, discernment, right? And how you continue to share this story, this gospel story that has been passed down through the ages in us, living and breathing in us, that we might keep sharing it for generations to come. Amen.
you may, we'll skip ahead to the sharing of the peace. The peace of Christ be with you always. You may be seated as we continue with the offering. If you're worshiping online, we encourage you to share a gift. You can go to St. John's homepage, and on the top right, you can click on the Give tab to see how to do that. We continue with the offering. Let us pray. God, we have not earned your grace or the abundance with which you shower us. In gratitude for your favor, we give back what we have been given for the sake of all your people. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We are using the communion ware from generations long ago. So all the generations who have communed in this place over the years join us in so many ways at the communion as the communion of saints. You'll I'll be invited to come to communion up the center aisle. There will be two stations up front. We'll serve communion by intinction. So we'll hand you a wafer of bread, and you can dip that wafer in the bread, in, into the wine, or into the juice if you would like. There will be juice and gluten-free wafers on this pulpit side of the church if you prefer either of those. If you're worshiping online, we encourage you to share the bread and the wine together now. And if you are by yourself, these are words just for you. This is the body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. You are welcome at this meal of mercy where we taste the generous love of Jesus Christ. Come as you are.
receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that you have strengthened our hearts with this feast of life and salvation. Shine the light of Christ on our path that we may do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Next week, make sure you set your clocks back and enjoy that extra hour of sleep. This afternoon, we do have, as Pastor Taryn mentioned, the affirmation of baptism service here at 2 o'clock. A welcome to the confirmation families who are here today. Uh, you can be a part of that service. You can join the live stream on Facebook at 2 o'clock for a confirmation service. On Thursday, just a few days ago, uh, you had four generations, of your fam uh, four generations of a family in your congregation who shared the sermon time and had a great conversation about generosity. So I encourage you to have those kinds of conversations uh, as Pastor Taryn encouraged you to do too. Please stand as you may for the closing blessing. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
peace serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.